So for the last two weeks of our Bio210L lab series, we will be undertaking a genomics lab. This genomics lab is typically done as a course-based undergraduate research experience where you guys would actually be conducting the research in the classroom and contributing to an active research project. But unfortunately, due to COVID-19, things have changed. So we'll do the best we can. Um, so your lab instructors and myself have put together a variety of video materials to help support and show you the kinds of activities that we would have expected you to pick up and learn about uh, during this experience. There are some specific lab outcomes um, that we would like you to come from the, uh, pull from this experience. And there are a lot of other things, sub outcomes that are not listed here, but I think most importantly, we want you to be able to make a material contribution to an active genome sequencing project. So the project that we're gonna be talking about today is an area of active research. Um, that is going on in my lab currently, uh, and part of a collaboration with researchers from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Inst Institute and also Texas A&M uh, University. In addition to that, hopefully at the end of this, you'll be able to see and understand how we use multiple lines of evidence to evaluate hypotheses. Um, so you'll see that there isn't just one way to think about data, that there may be more than one way that we want to think about a problem when we try to evaluate a hypothesis and how we would use evidence to evaluate that hypothesis. Thirdly, uh, you'll hopefully you'll get a good understanding, a deeper understanding of the biochemical properties of DNA and how we're able to manipulate them to isolate DNA from a tissue sample. And this is one of the hallmark things that we, has to happen in for molecular biology work to occur in the lab, we need to be able to isolate nucleotides from tissues and cells, whether that be DNA or RNA, or proteins from tissues and cells. So why genomics? Well, over time, uh, there has been a dramatic decrease in the cost of what it, what it costs to sequence a genome. The human genome uh, cost about $3 billion to do, uh, and since then, we've been watching a steady decrease in what it costs to sequence a genome. And it was steady for a while, uh, but the early 2000s, and then you can see there's a drastic drop off here. What drove that drop off was the advent of some key innovations in biotechnology, specifically what is referred to as next generation sequencing. So we had some major technological advancement and it caused the cost of sequencing to plummet. And what this meant was suddenly it was a lot more affordable. You didn't have to be a large giant institute to do genome sequencing. You could be anywhere in the world now and do genome sequencing. We're gonna be doing it in this lab. The result of that decrease in costs has led to an exponential increase in the number of genome sequences. Uh, in fact, there are large efforts like the Earth Biogenome Project and the Vertebrate, Giant, uh, the Vertebrate Genome Project um, in which I try to participate in some fashion uh, where we're actually trying to sequence tens of thousands if you know the 70,000 vertebrate species uh, all of them that exist in the world or even in the Earth Biogenome Project all 1.5 million species that may exist on Earth. So there's huge effort going into it we're making lots of sequences because the cost of it has gone down significantly. This leads us to an area of biology that has developed in more recent times, it's been around for a while, but it's really developed uh, intensely over the last, say, 15 to 20 years. And that's the field of comparative genomics. Um, you might not be all that familiar with either of those two terms, comparative and genomics. So let's just break them down real quick. So when we think about gene, you know, we're talking about a unit of heredity that is transferred from parent to offspring and is held to determine some characteristic of that offspring. Classic example we might have is a whole bunch of exons that come together to form uh, the coding sequence, which is then transcribed and translated into a protein sequence. So that would bring us to our second definition, which is a distinct set of nucleotides forming part of a chromosome of the order of which determines the order of monomers in a peptide, polypeptide or nucleic acid molecule, which a cell or virus may synthesize. So it's a gene. Gene, when we talk about genes, right, this is the uh, origin of the field of genetics, right? We were talking about units of heredity. And so you can think about it, when we talk about genetics, we are often talking about distinct units, individual units, or sets of units. When we talk about genomes, we're talking about the complete set of genetic material in a cell or organism. So we're talking about everything that exists within the cell or organism. We're no longer talking about necessarily individual specific genes. 
So now that the level we've gone above the gene into the genome. So when we talk about genomics, this is the branch of molecular biology that, that's concerned with the structure, function, evolution, and the mapping of genomes. Um, another term that is a classic term in biology is the idea of uh, comparative. This is the field of comparative biology. Right? In comparative biology, this is the cross-lineage approach that uses patterns of natural variation and disparity, so things that are the same and things that are different from each other, so looking at them in comparison, to understand phylogenetic and the mechanisms and patterns that drive the diversity of life. Extending that definition of comparative biology and specifying it down to comparative genomics, again, thinking about what genomics means, becomes a field in which the complete genome sequences of different species are compared for regions of conservation, again, similarity and variation, divergence or disparity, in order to understand the genetic changes and mechanisms that underlie the diversity of life. So we can see how these fields have sort of flowed into each other and in current times, the field of comparative genomics is becoming more and more important in our understanding of how biology works. Brings us to a, a quote that I've always liked from Goethe. Um, he who does not know foreign languages does not know anything about his own. In this case, this concept of needing to know something about other systems before we can really know about ourselves is very important in our understanding of biology. So if we truly want to understand human biology, uh, say for medical research or health research, what, you know, these uh, very applied important fields, it's very important that we understand how our genome works as compared to other genomes. Right? So with no point of reference, it's very difficult to really truly understand ourselves. And that is one of the important things that we need comparative genomics for. Additionally, again, we are looking for areas in which we see similarities and differences. So if we can find things that are the same or are conserved among us and other genomes, then we can also better understand, understand ourselves. A classic example of uh, where comparative genomics is important can be the example of homeotic genes or Hox genes. In this case, uh, what we see is we see that, that there's conserved collinearity of homologous developmental genes. So if we look at Drosophila, which is the classic uh, study system, or one of the classic study systems for looking at Hox genes, right, we can see that the Hox genes are all laid out along a chromosome in a specific order. They're collinear, right? And this is the, we can see that this order that they're, uh, displayed on these chromosomes is actually directly associated with the location where they are active during early development. So different adult atomical regions are therefore um, associated with the early developmental expression of each of these genes. And they are expressed in an anterior to posterior fashion. So these genes are ex expressed earlier than these genes, and that leads to the development heading from an anterior to posterior direction. We see a similar conserved pattern observed in humans. So we see genes which are orthologous or are share, that share a common ancestor right, in human and also are collinear in the same way that Drosophila genes are collinear. Expressed in the same way, ex affecting development in a similar spatial fashion, right? In addition to that, we see some additional complexity in humans. So we see things that are very this, that are very much the same between Drosophila and human, and we see things that are very different. For instance, there have been two rounds of genome duplication, which have led to there being a lot, a lot more copies of these Hox genes, and so a more a more diversified role in development of all of these different components. So there we can see that taking this comparative genomics perspective can really give us some true insight into the origin and function of these different sets of genes. In this study, we're going to be looking at a species um, uh, of fish with the genus and species Pisiliopsis monica. Pisiliopsis monica is a freshwater fish found in the Sonoran Desert. Uh, it reproduces in some unique ways. So it can reproduce in the typical sexual fashion. Um, and then it can also reproduce in a hemiclonal fashion. This hemiclonal fashion is pretty unique 
um, and is mostly just found in fishes and related fishes uh, of this group. So in this case, what happens is that females of Pseliopsis monica in some populations will mate with males of the other spe of another species. Could be a, either Pseliopsis lucida or Pseliopsis occidentalis. We see that the, there are actually two methods of reproduction. There's gynogenesis and hybridogenesis. Um, I'm just going to be talking mostly about the hybridogenic case, uh, but what we see here is that we have female Pseliopsis monicas, and they only create eggs that carry the maternal genome, just the monica genome. The lucida male will come and, his, and fertilize this egg, allowing it to develop into this female, right? But again, the female will never pass on this male genome. She never creates an egg with a male genome in it, never with the lucida genome. So in this case, she becomes a virtual clone, right? She's a hemiclonal organism. Uh, in the gynogenic case, the, the male genome actually does not um, enter the egg. The egg is simply a copy of the female who carries a uh, monica in two lucida genomes in this case. And what happens is the sperm just activates the egg into development. So there's no... Uh, Invade, uh, inclusion of this other male genome in this egg. So again, it becomes a, a pretty clonal system. So this is a bizarre, kind of a bizarre way uh, or a different way of reproducing that we see from most vertebrates. Um, and what's really interesting too is we tend to find these hybridogenic females in the same populations as we find individuals that reproduce in the typical sexual fashion. Uh, and so it's it's an it's an odd combination, but it sets up a really interesting system, um, one that is just unique biologically, which we might want to understand where this diversity comes from. These fishes are all live bearers. Um, they're part of a group in which we find placentation has evolved in fish, so they become a good model system for looking at some of these questions. You know, how has live birth evolved? How has placentation evolved? But because they're also passing on clonal variants of themselves or clonal versions of themselves through time, they also become a, an effective system for looking at how mutation can affect the evolution of populations, and have possible utility as being an environmental indicator species since their genetic background remains the same across all their offspring, we could expect any uh, changes in traits that they display to be, to be largely affected by the environment they're experiencing. So they become a good environmental indicator species. This is a genomics project, right? We're looking at the full complement of DNA in these cells. Just to remind you, you know, when we're talking about DNA, we're talking about um, uh, an, of molecules that are comprised of nucleotides. These are, these are, these are those deoxyribose sugars. Um, they've got, we've got four of them. We've got cytosine, guanine, adenine, and thymine, right? Our purity, our pyrimidines and purines. Uh, this is a double-stranded stable molecule. It's got covalent bonds um, within the strands, right? And it's got hydrogen bonds between the strands. It's what we call anti-parallel as it moves in a five prime to three prime direction going up one end of the helix and then it moves in the opposite direction uh, coming down the helix. Uh, and one thing that's really important about this molecule is that it's got a charge, right? This is a negatively charged uh, molecule. And that means that it's going to be uh, readily um, suspended and dissolved in water. So we need a whole lot of DNA from these fish that we're gonna use to make a good sample, to get a good sample to do some genome sequencing. So we can learn something about the fish. We're gonna create a reference genome eventually for this organism. So we can better understand these questions about its genetics. One, how it may learn something about its unique biology, learn something more broadly about the evolution of live birth or um, how mutation affects the evolution of species, or get better understanding of how their genetics would, would be affected by environmental changes and use them as a possible model system for understanding the effects of, say, pesticides in the environment or some other kinds of um, uh, pollutant in the environment. So to do all that, though, we need to actually have a good sample uh, to do some genome sequencing. And when we think about getting a good DNA sample, what does that mean? That means we want something that's going to be pure. We want something that's give us, going to give us a good yield so that we have enough material to do our sequencing on. And we also would like it to be high molecular weight. In other words, we don't want the DNA to be fragmented up into a bunch of little pieces. We want them to be large pieces, which weigh a lot, so that when we do our sequencing, we can get really good sequencing results. Because the sequencer we're going to be using, which I'll show you in a second, 
is what's known as a long read sequencer. So in order to do this, we're going to have a little friendly competition. Now, this would have been a friendly competition between all of you, but since we're online, uh, it's going to end up being a friendly competition between myself, um, your instructor, Melissa, and one of our technicians, Jessica. But again, we need to get a good sample, right? So how are we going to do that? Um, one, we're going to be focusing on the purity of the sample, which we will measure with a uh, spectrophotometer called a nanodrop. Uh, we will get some information on yield, but I'll just warn you that information on yield from nanodrops is not always the most reliable. Uh, but in order to estimate how pure our sample is, we'll be looking at ratios of absorbance at different levels. We'll be carrying, comparing how much absorbance we observe at 260 as compared to 230 and 280. And based upon the ratio, we'll be able to tell whether or not we get a good, clean sample. Um, purity is important. We have a lot of contaminants that can really inhibit our sequencing. We're also going to quantify our DNA using an a instrument called a qubit. And a qubit uses a fluorescent dye to bind to double-stranded DNA. And then looks at how much measures the intensity of this dye um, in order to get a very precise measure of how much DNA is in a sample, and only the DNA. One of the problems with the nanodrop is because it's absorbance, um, it could be measuring DNA. It also is measuring anything else that might absorb at that frequency, like RNA or um, any kind of contaminant. But the qubit is very precise because it only dyes DNA or RNA, depending upon the kit that you use. And so since it only buys one of these, either of them, you can get a very accurate measure of whichever one you're looking at. We'll also be looking at a gel of this data in order to find the highest molecular weight to make sure our samples are exhibiting uh, signals of high molecular weight. So this is what a gel could look like. We have our ladders over here going from large molecular weight items to small molecular weight bands. Right? And here we can see across this DNA isolation which samples are high molecular weight and which ones are fragmented. So when they're large smears like this, that means that there's a whole bunch of DNA. This, these large bands have been somehow broken up and we end up with large smears, uh, meaning that these are just small pieces of DNA. To do the sequencing in this, we're going to use a, a type of single molecule sequencing. It's called an, it's, it's referred to often as Oxford nanopore sequencing. Um, and you can see down here, this is in the greatest picture, better one you'll see soon, but this is what's known as a min ion. And so it's a small DNA sequencer. It attaches to a laptop or some other type of computer, right? We can load our sample into it. There's a flow cell on it. And that flow cell will then generate our DNA sequencing. So it's a mobile, incredibly compact method for generating DNA sequencing. For DNA sequencing, intact DNA strands are processed by the nanopores and can be analyzed in real time. The nanopore sequences the fragments that are presented to it regardless of their length, rather than generating reads of a specific length. This could be reads of hundreds of kilobases or more. Nanopore long reads simplify assembly and sequencing of repetitive regions, also improving the speed of species identification in metagenomic experiments. So what happens during nanopore sequencing? The DNA strands to be sequenced are mixed with copies of a processive enzyme, shown here in green. As the DNA enzyme complexes approach the nanopore, the single-stranded DNA is pulled through the aperture. The enzyme ratchets the DNA strand through the nanopore one base at a time. The speed of the enzyme can be controlled. More data is yielded per second the faster the enzyme runs, but with no deterioration in accuracy. As the DNA moves through the pore, the combination of nucleotides in the strand being processed creates a characteristic disruption in the electrical current. This nanopore signal can be used to determine the order of bases on that DNA strand. Nanopores have processed... So based on the charge that is being measured, it's able to predict what the makeup is of the, I think, five base pair section that it's looking at at any one time. Lengths of hundreds of kilobases. And when a nanopore has processed a complete read, it will start a new one. Nanopores start to stream data as soon as the experiment begins with base calling taking place locally. Users can also take advantage of epitome workflows for real-time analysis, continuing the experiment until sufficient data has been analyzed to determine the answer to a biological question. With nanopore sequencing, the user has the ability to run the experiment until the answer is reached, rather than working to an arbitrary instrument runtime. The workflow described here is adaptable and is used to sequence a variety of molecules in real-time, including genomic DNA, 
amplified genomic DNA, and PCR amplicons. Interestingly enough, uh, the technology that we'll be using today is being readily used throughout the world in looking at um, SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19 strain. Um, there is a process that uses a reverse transcript A step, which you guys learned about last week in terms of how they do the testing for um, COVID-19. And so in this case, this reverse transcript A step takes the RNA genome from the virus, because these are RNA viruses, and creates cDNA or complementary DNA, then a step of PCR, and then some additional steps that prepare it for sequencing where we add sort of identifying barcoding sequences and adapters to the end of those sequences, and then we put it through a sequencer. And this is the gambit of the different min Oxford nanopore sequencers. We have a Promethean a Promethe ion, a grid ion, um, we've got various types of min ions down here, and even uh, smaller flow cells as well. So this just gives you an idea of how this process works, but you can go from RNA to a DNA sequence in about seven hours. It's a pretty uh, interesting and exciting way to do science. It's portable, you can take it with you. They use this to do Zika, uh, uh, Ebola studies in Africa, so you can take the sequencers into the field with them. Um, and it's a way to generate very rapid data and to get additional information that's very important in the surveillance of disease in terms of figuring out how viruses are spreading across the landscape. Once we have our DNA, we'll get it ready for those sequencers I showed you. Um, and we have a very simple sequencing workflow um, using uh, what's known as a transposon complex, transposon complex uh, which is part of something referred to as tagmentation. Um, and so it's really quite straightforward. We basically just extract our DNA, we prepare our flow cell for use, and then we tagment our DNA using a fragmentation mix. And what this tagmentation process involves is mixing our genomic DNA with this barcoded transposon complex. It will cleave it and then tag this double-stranded DNA with these barcoded sequences. These barcoded sequences are then attached to adapters, and then you've got that little motor protein on there, and then that's gonna just pull your sequence right into your flow cell and nanopore, right into your nanopore and, and help it get sequenced. So it's actually a, like it's like a 20 minute library prep step. It's a very quick one. All right, so that's the overall background for the lab. Uh, there'll be some quiz questions on some of this material. So um, please feel free to refer back to this video for any information you might need.